Welcome to the Level Up Your Band podcast, episode 37. Hello and welcome back to the Level Up Your Band podcast. My name is Gavin Patterson and I'm here with Julian Pombo. Hey, how's it going? Not too bad. Um, I've got a good one today. Uh, yeah, it's going to be good. So this is our sixth guest, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and our second Graham, incidentally. We've had, we've had a Graham on already. So today <laughs> we are going to be interviewing Graham Rory. Graham is an award-winning fiddle and mandolin player from Orkney, uh, just at the north tip of Scotland, if you're not from Scotland. He is a founding member of the folk quartet NOS and is a graduate of the traditional music course at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Graham has also featured on fiddle and mandolin for albums by artists including the Red Hot Chili Pipers' Doogie McCants, BBC Radio 2 Young Folk Award 2017 winners Josie Duncan and Pablo La Fuente and 2018 MG Alba Scots Singer of the Year Iona Fife. He also engineered and produced Iona's latest track uh, Dark Turn of Mind which I didn't know by the way which is pretty cool. And he also has the sexiest accent in the world, <laughs> as you will see. So without further ado, I give you <laughs> Graham Roy. How are you doing? Thanks for ah, coming on. Not bad at all. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh, it's, so, that's quite an introduction. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a mouthful as well. Jeez. Um, so yeah, welcome on. Uh, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for agreeing to do this. Um, we've known each other, I think I was thinking about it last night. I think we met... Was it via my wedding band? I think was that's how I met you, and then we kind of bumped into yeah. each other in the Celtic scene as well. Yeah, I think that's it. So it must have been. I think I've been doing gigs with you guys with studio maybe four years. Yeah, something I like was going to say twenty sixteen, which is probably about right. Um, yeah, around that time. Uh, yeah, so I can remember. I think perhaps the first time I met you. Can you remember the gig we did up at? Um, just beyond Fort William on the on the west coast, the one with all the midges, the midges in that big <laughs> tent. <Yeah. laughs> and and uh, I, I remember that one specifically because me and Hermie did that gig and then drove back to Glasgow because right. I was flying that's to right. Orkney the next day. Yeah, yeah, that um, was a brutal evening. Honestly, you, like <laughs> the, we've got quite a lot of um, foreign listeners. Um, a midge is a tiny wee sort of mosquito fly but less yeah. deadly and more annoying um they just they're it's awful oh, they're awful awful <laughs> awful awful things yeah as somebody who comes from a country that has mosquitoes in it i'd rather have mosquitoes <laughs> at this point you'd rather have malaria than because they're images. bigger you can swat them away it's like it's a bigger target you know oh they're they're just dreadful you actually deal with it but this particular this particular time uh i was sitting up the back i was in a teepee if i've if I remember correctly, and That's there was right, there was yeah. lights shining up the up the edge of the TP, and the midges were just crawling on the tent. You could have like gathered a, just a handful of them. They were just everywhere, and we're spraying this midgey stuff everywhere, trying to keep it off us. Oh, it was dreadful. And mm. t- to throw um, insult to injury, we also had. Do you remember they brought out like twenty five reheated Domino's pizzas from the freezer? Oh, and sat them up the back, right. and we were tucking into these pizzas, thinking, "How do they get these here?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, we just uh, took them out the deep freeze this morning." What? what? Domino's deep uh, freeze? Oh, <laughs> some gig. Anyway, let's oh. let's fire on. Let's not talk about terrible gig stories. We'll get Bad we'll times. get to that at that, the end. That can come later. That is coming later. We're yes, definitely that's they're all relevant. <laughs> yeah. So, I wanted to. Um, get a background on your your sort of musical beginnings that's kind of how we uh, do interviews just like why ah. why music where where did it start for you um as a fiddle player or as a musician did you did you start on fiddle 
is the first question. Yeah, so uh, when I was in primary school, it's free and not need to learn an instrument in primary school. Okay. Um, so they, they do a kind of audition process. You can choose brass or woodwind or string instruments. And I, my f- sister had been learning fiddle previously, so I knew the teacher and thought, oh, I'll just go for it, kind of maybe primary five, about eight years old, I think. And uh, yeah, went for that. And then from there, I just kind of really enjoyed it. I had a really yeah. inspiring teacher, a chap called Douglas Montgomery. Uh, he plays in, in folk bands and yeah, he was just one of those guys that's not only an amazing player, but he knows how to translate it right. into quite inspiring lessons too. So yeah, that was my kind of first foray into music making. All right. Because I was going to ask, um, just it depends on the genre as well. <clears throat> you tend to find with folk music, it rarely comes from school and it mostly comes from family. Um, just growing up on a farm, um, me personally, the Scottish folk or Scottish country dancing or that that style of music is ingrained in the sort of the sort of culture that I grew up in and I got introduced to that before I was even at school and I know a, a couple of folk musicians who are in the same boat whereas their their granddad had a an accordion or you know they it was just very uh, rooted in would you say that's the same for you yeah, it was funny for me because none of my family or close family are particularly musical at all really um my granddad on my mum's side played um but I I never actually knew him or knew of him playing so I'm the only one right. I have a cousin that plays as well but uh-huh. everybody else everybody else enjoys music so like you say there was always music on mm. um but yeah I'm I'm the only one that's kind of it's funny gone that bit far funny to yeah play. um because it's like it's I suppose I'm um, growing up in it um for me just because there was always music on in the background and my grandparents well, my, my grandpa especially was very, very into, you know, like Jimmy Shand and, you know, the old, you know, the, the, the old sort of really, really heavy traditional stuff, um, country yeah. stuff. That, that kind of side of my mum's side of the family were really into that. And I, I had like books given to me, like music books that I could play on the organ and the, the keyboard and stuff. And uh, that kind of got me interested at an early age. Um, but like... Mm. I would say maybe less so with jazz, Julian. It's kind of not... It depends where you grow up, I suppose. Um, Yeah, well, and it depends on your parents. Because, like, I got introduced to jazz through my dad because he he loves all that kind of stuff. Like, he doesn't play or anything. He just... He loves jazz music and, like, um, prog and, like, just really, like high information like really complicated <laughs> music it's just what he's into Aye. it's weird yeah yeah um he doesn't doesn't really he plays a little bit he used to play a little bit of classical guitar but like he um like he's, he just enjoys it he has no idea what's going on really but he just yeah, yeah yeah just likes the sound so that's kind of how i got into it but i guess yeah same way it's like Apart from my dad, who played a little bit of guitar, but he gave it up, mm-hmm. and now he's getting back into it again. Like me and my sister, just sort of fell into it through primary school as well. So yeah, it's weird. You, yeah, um, yeah. It's like um, it always gets me when someone is like super musical, and then no one in their family is musical. It's like, whoa, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, you wonder where on earth <laughs> yeah, it yeah. arrived from. Yeah, what happened? So you're playing fiddle in primary school uh presumably up into high school um was there a point that you went i think i want to do this as a thing like as a maybe a professional thing or do extra studies out with school yeah definitely because i think in primary school i think a lot of folk go through it that kind of other things taking over, like, oh, maybe go and play football or mm-hmm. yeah. go and do other bits of it. And there was probably a few times that I nearly just completely gave up the fiddle in primary school. Yeah. And then it's that turning point, you kind of had that choice, do you want to take it on with you as you go to secondary? Aye. And it was in maybe second, second year of secondary school. Because um, all my lessons, I was learning, it was funny, I was learning the fiddle 
as an instrument through a combination of classical and folk playing. And my teacher kind of described it. He was like, it's the, the same wooden box Aye. with metal strings on it, whatever the genre is. So as long as you have the capacity to play it mm. mm-hmm. in a in a manner that it doesn't really matter what notes are, it's then exposure to that music mm-hmm. that means that you're playing it authentically or whatever that is. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, which was quite a nice way to have it. So I would do a, a few classical pieces and then a few of us would just sit around and have tunes. Um, and that's kind of what started it. Maybe second year, a few of us started playing and we went, because the folk festival in Orkney, they used to do an open stage at it. And if you won the open stage, you got a place in the Danny Kyle open stage. So Liz Clark, that organises that, used to come up and judge the one in Artney and then take a band down. So there was a group of, I think it was seven of us originally, and Aidan Moody, that uh, still play with the NOS, yep. um, he was in it too. We came down, and that was Celtic Connections in 2012. So we were in third year at high school right. um, at 15, and we ended up getting uh, one of the, the Danny Awards and then flying home the next day to sit at maths prelim. <laughs> and it was a, a bizarre um, kind of crossover, but just being around, kind of doing a few of the Artney Folk Festivals and then landing in Glasgow mm-hmm. as this kind of innocent, fresh-faced Arcadian that <laughs> was just excited to see a fast food restaurant. <laughs> um, <laughs> coupling that with, with live music, it was like, ah, oh, yeah. this could actually be a thing. Aye. And then that was that was probably the spark moment that I would say, like, you're speaking enough, so... Yeah, yeah. So, so after you leave high school, you made a sort of beeline for the, the RCS, I'm assuming. That's it, yeah. So I auditioned to a few places. Again, I was saying I, I had a bit of that classical background and, mm. like, went through my grades and things. So I, I looked at a few classical courses and I did have auditions at Glasgow Uni and maybe a couple in Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. But the audition process for the RCS trad course was earlier and I, I got my unconditional for that and kind of got my heart set on it after being in the place and yeah. meeting a few of the people that were auditioning at the same time. So yeah, I just finished high school and I found out in the November. So I just uh-huh. kind of made sure that I was doing the bare mid- minimum in sixth year of school, playing lots yeah. of fiddle and then... Aye. And then yeah, set that's off. what I did. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, yeah, it's exactly the same. I got my unconditional in November, but that was for the composition course. And I went, well, that's I it. don't need to do anything in school now. It's great. <laughs> oh. Teachers hated me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was not yeah. in that position whatsoever. I, I got right to the end of school, uh, not knowing where I was going to go or what I was going to do until, in fact, even, even through the summer holidays, after leaving school, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do come September. And I applied for a college um, in like August. And they said, yeah, you can come down for an audition. The auditions take place in like March, but you can come down and we can maybe see. It was on the 4th of September, 2009. And went did my audition and he was like, okay, cool. Your class is upstairs. That was it. <laughs> Just like <laughs> audition, interview and first day of college all in the one day. I was like, all right, I guess I'm in college wow. now. So, <laughs> and then my first class was sound engineering. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I want to do this. I was like, course over. <laughs> can go home now. Um, and then had to endure two know. more years of it. I'm totally different. It's totally one of those subjects that you don't really think about that much at school. No. But oh. there mm. must be so many musicians that, are really into that side of things. We were quite lucky. Mm-hmm. In my sixth year, they'd just started, they'd kind of built a brand new school. And the last six months, the music department had a brand new, like, uh, I think at the time, it was Pro Tools 9 had just come out. Yeah. And the whole lot was fully rigged up, like tie lines to practice rooms. And you could just sit there and go, oh, yeah, actually, this is something that I'm yeah. quite into. Yeah, that's um, but it's a shame lucky. that that's not more accessible at schools. Yeah, yeah, a lot of I hear I hear from a lot of like younger people. Listen to me, like I'm an old fart, only 29 for God's sake. Um, <laughs> but I I can get people in the studio quite a lot who are in their early 20s, sometimes late teens, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we did a bit of sound production in school." I'm like, "What? 
<laughs> Where was that when I was at school? Like, we didn't even yeah. have timpani. Like, we just had a crappy old beat up drum kit and an upright piano with rips on the side of it. Like, that's all we had. <laughs> like, there was nothing, nothing really. We had we had Sibelius on some computers, but um, sound production was a total mystery to mm. me until I got introduced in college. <clears throat> and then I just took to it. But um, I want to talk about that as well, your interest in sound production. Because um, the, the funny thing with um, sound production, see that the hard hardest thing for a creative person or a musician especially is to try and figure out how to make a viable living from it. And I think sound production <laughs> is a fairly decent option um, for for people who are good at it to make a little bit of side money while they're doing the musician stuff. And I've managed to for sure. to, to, to do that well, <laughs> minus this year, of course. But That's uh, <laughs> mostly, and it's something that was never talked about in any of my music studies pre-college. Uh, it just wasn't yeah. an option. It just was not, what's that? You know, nobody knew about it. Um, and when, I, when I've discovered that, I was like, oh, I could do gigs and studio stuff. And I'm like, mm, yeah, that's 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 cool. Um, so, are are you kind of in the same boat, or do you do it as a kind of more of a hobby? This sort of sound yeah. sound engineering side. For sure, it's funny. It's a total combination. It started off as a hobby, like I yeah. kind of had access to that equipment at school, and then same at the conservatoire. I I took a few modules in it because uh -huh. it was something that just really interested me. Had like a couple of bits of kit, but uh -huh. nothing crazy and I started out just working at things the first step was trying to be able to articulate myself in a studio setting yeah I think even mm -hmm. if you don't have microphones and things being able to quite clearly say and on gigs as well actually because a lot of the terminology is quite similar mm -hmm. you can say I need this yeah, yeah, particular yeah. frequency or range or it kind of speeds things up mm -hmm. And then from that, it's funny when you're saying about making extra money, the first step for me that it was saving me a bit of money right? Okay. Um, by being able to, so we're kicking off the the first NOS album or the one that we did last year. Um, it was all done, all the tempo mapping was done previously. Uh -huh. um, so all the tracks got midied in and then because I knew my way around Pro Tools, Mm -hmm. I could tempo mm. map everything. Yeah. And then suddenly you've saved yourself, I don't know, easy £500 worth of studio time <laughs> yeah. by mm. by mapping out and doing the stuff. Because although engineers like to have you in the studio for that time, uh -huh. they don't want to be sitting going, is this the tempo you want this? Do you want it to speed <laughs> up here? Yeah. Like that, that's not where their skill set is. Their mm -hmm. skill set's in capture in the music once you've got it ready yeah yeah, um, yeah so i kind of discovered that there was actually a way of being able to demo and get things set to make good use of yeah the studio time you were paying for mm -hmm. and then from that you figure out more and more and a few folk have come in to record that's kind of been my my journey through the different stages but yeah Aye, that's cool um I w that that's partly why we're doing the podcast is to try and um, help people just, yeah. just they don't even know that there's a there there. Do you know what I mean? They don't even know that yeah. there's that knowledge to be acquired. Um, even if we just yeah, raise up a sure. thing, oh, this is a thing. They can go, oh, that's a thing. I need to go and look into this thing. Um, it's, it's really valuable. Um, as you said, like knowing... <laughs> it's like I can. I thought of an example when you were saying something uh, handy to know at live gigs and things that you can, yeah. you know, know the jargon. Uh, our uh, piper Scott Figgins, who's just a <laughs> absolute roaster. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I told him. I, I told him um, uh, the meaning of high pass filter, and it's the, he just loves using it. It's like it just go, it goes up live and just goes up to the microphone and goes to the the engineer. And goes, excuse me. Can you give me your best high pass filter that you have available? And he just he just <laughs> loves using that. because uh, now he knows what it is. Like joking aside, um he now knows the jargon, you know, and that that's that's the whole yeah. point. That's the whole point. 
is and for the number of pipers if you're doing even sound on a keely or things a piper will come and say oh can you get rid of that yeah 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 of the fingers yeah 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 and sometimes it can take especially because engineers aren't genre specific mm-hmm. quite often they'll go what is it you mean is that a, a top end tippy tappy thing or is it actually the sub of the air moving mm-hmm. so yeah just having that knowledge yeah i would be pre pre-warning an engineer to go and hand him a coffee filter when he asks for it <laughs> i think that would have <laughs> <laughs> oh. your best high pass filter yeah here you go aye cool um so when I talk about NOS, so where where did NOS begin? Um, where is its origins? So it started off as just me and Aidan um, uh, that I went to school where he was in that original band. And I think we discovered quite early at university that having a university degree does by no means guarantee you any form of work once you leave. Even less so now, but Aye. we were kind of on the lines of if we can get going and get gigging and get experienced, the ball will be rolling then by the time we leave. Yeah, yeah. And it's a good chance to make a bit of side money as well. Um, but we kind of just kicked it off because we were used to playing together. We'd, we'd toured with a couple of singers from Artney um, and kind of gotten to know each other's playing really well and then just thought, oh, we might as well go for this and get on the circuit early mm-hmm. and I think that's what held us in good stead then for graduating and and having done the years of poorly paid gigs and mm-hmm. touring around venues when you're not quite sure yeah. what the audience is going to be like because whatever folks say those times exist Yeah. Um, so that was what kind of thinking we enjoyed playing music together and we thought might as well get going new Mm-hmm. Um, early on in uni and mm. yeah it just kind of developed from there we went along and we yeah we joined up with a couple of guys um, from our year at uni just what that we enjoyed playing with yeah um, Gregor and Connor and then <clears throat> it kind of formed into what it is now so Craig came in and joined he replaced Gregor and joined in Baran and now Connor plays flute and whistle so mm. It was a kind of, it was quite a slow burner for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. But it kind of meant that we could build up a bit of a loyal following that you could tour around yeah. and have folk coming in. Yeah. Um, so that, that's 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 always a good thing because in the folk scene, um, I suppose a, a lot of our listeners won't really know much about the folk scene, but the this kind of folky sort of sitting in and playing sessions kind of thing it's kind of each player for themselves a lot of the time it's kind of scratch bands and like last minute oh we'll get 10 musicians together and just make a thing and it's mm. a lot of it's quite sporadic so this whole i don't know how old this is this let's form a band and make it permanent thing I, am i right in saying that's not really it's not a it's a fairly new thing um, yeah, yeah, relatively kind speaking, of you're probably talking maybe the nineties, yeah, like at the earliest, maybe. Yeah, it probably in terms of the kind of modern folk style. I think around late seventies, eighties. Okay, mm. right. there was maybe there was maybe kind of five or six doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, Ali Bain, he's a, a fiddle player, and he's only just turned seventy, and he was the first Scottish musician to make a full time living out of playing Scottish music. Uh-huh. Um, and he only started... So yeah, you're probably talking he'd have been the only one for the first part of the 70s. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, and then there was a kind of bit of lull once they stopped the kind of let's have tartan shortbread tins on the BBC <laughs> kind of folk music. There was a bit of a yeah. lull. And then, yeah, what it is now... I would say late 90s in terms of the Glasgow scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Becoming that, let's actually arrange and write new music. Yeah. um, In a traditional style. Yeah, it's kind of, it's doing what um, the sort of jazz roots band, so you're talking all your rock and roll coming into, you know, heavy rock or pop or all, all that kind of stuff has been happening since, 
you know, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s with big bands and then splitting off into rock and roll with Elvis and the Beatles and then everything we've got ever since. They've been doing that and capitalising on that market for years and years. And that business model is now finally catching up with the the folk, uh, the the tradies. um, And uh, (laughs) you see a lot of people um, either really like that or they really hate it. You can see people who are like real traditionalists and just, you know... It's not something to be bought and sold and all, all this. Um, yeah. But <coughs> the way I see it is if you can do what you love and play good music and get a penny for it, I, I don't see what the problem That's is, it. you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some great bands out there. Um, as a result of this sort of massive surge in... Um, it's a kind of popularisation of Scottish music. Um, you get some right cracking bands. Um, yeah, mm, and I think it often it. surprises people to people go, "Oh, I'm not really into traddy stuff." And then you go, "I bet I could find you a band." Oh yeah, that yeah. you would really that you would never ever associate with. You'd go, "Oh, fiddles and bagpipes." Ah, uh, nah, nah. nah. <laughs> but I think a lot of folk really do surprise themselves. They go, "Oh, you know what? That's actually mm-hmm. pretty rocking." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. It's 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 weird. Um, I had actually had someone in here recently who's kind of into like post punk rock, you know, a little bit of metal scene kid kind of music, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I'm leaving. I'm leaving this this band. Um, I want to get into Scottish folk." And I was like, "Oh, like wow!" <laughs> it's like I actually listened to some stuff recently and thought it was actually really cool. I'm like, "Oh, that's cool." And what I love as well about it is the the sort of genre mashes. So like some uh, technical like progressive you know odd time signatures and all that coming in um and some rockier stuff even some jazz seeping into folk as well you get some really cool yeah. uh blends mm. uh, i really like that for sure it's such a cool yeah. scene um and it's i would say glasgow's kind of at the center of that um, yeah definitely with the, um, it was a big reason I moved to Glasgow just because like you say there's it's not just one bar that's only traddies that meet up there's kind of yeah 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 you can you can go across the city mm-hmm. and I suppose even like myself um, working with you guys with studio like that's a covers band yeah yeah of people with I find it amazing the range of backgrounds just in that group of seven people I know Um but you're still meeting up. There's a there's an amazing video that Chris Teeley talks about genre hopping. Yeah. Um and he says about oh if you're if you truly claim to love music, then you'll give every genre a bit of a chance. Yeah, of course. Mm. And he said, like being like watching a Mahler symphony, he says, some of that music, why would you not have the same reaction to that as you would at a Radiohead concert? Mm-hmm. He mm. says it's it's the same creation attention. It's that same big release. Yep. Um, that it, it is. It's it's surprising when you start working with people out with what would be your field. You would class it as. Yeah, yeah. Um, it can it can be when the best music's made. It's great. That's what you say, Julian, quite a lot. Um, if you, everyone's sort of a Spotify playlist should be as uh, yeah eclectic as yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Like, yeah, and for me, that was like a it was that that was like a very more I I would say like a more recent revelation because very much when I've started off, I think everybody's like this to some extent. Anyway, when I went to uni, I was just like, yes, I'm gonna only listen to like really hardcore, atonal, like (laughs) contemporary music because that's what everybody's writing on my course that I'm on. (laughs) And then I was like, oh no, wait. And then once I joined the jazz course, I then. Well, I obviously started listening to jazz and then from there I was like, oh, like a lot of like, you know, like late 80s, early 90s hip hop has like a lot of influences from jazz because they sampled a lot of jazz records. So then I got really into hip hop and rap and then uh, I rediscovered my, I was really into punk music. So then I started listening to more punk music again. My my Spotify, like most played like tracks are an absolute mess it's just all over the place you know and that that's kind of where you want it to be because you'll never and i always i think this goes back to what you were saying as well at the beginning uh graham when you were uh talking about you know learning violin and learning kind of like trad songs and doing classical stuff as well like 
with bass anyway, like I always try and like learn as many little different styles of music as possible, you know, like, you know, yeah. country and, um, you know, ska and punk bass lines and funk stuff and whatever. It's, it's really useful to just get yeah. as much of a, um, I don't know, just learn as much as you can and listen to as much as you can. Yeah. It's like, it's going to be so beneficial for you in the, in the long run. It'll take you to places you won't, you wouldn't even thought were places to begin with, you know? Yeah, that's it. And you totally build up a kind of, you hear a lot of people that in education places speaking about like your toolbox, mm. like um, you get a lot of the time that certainly from my own perspective, you get traditional fiddle players that wouldn't dream of looking beyond your kind of first position. They wouldn't work higher up the fingerboard mm. because they've, they've never had someone go, go and play some Vivaldi and learn how to work the instrument there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it means that you've suddenly got this new texture, like yep. The and as well, like even for uh, drummers like yourself, like the amount of folky drummers that I've heard that never touch the toms, <laughs> or um, even if you were to tell a drummer that's predominantly playing rock music, go, okay, this track, no snare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it's a, that's it. You you suddenly go, well, I've got. I was playing along with this jazz record and there was this cool thing they were doing on the ride. Um, that's, that's something I can transfer here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's just kind of eighth notes and quarter notes. And exactly. Yeah. With a line over the top. So it's super interesting. Yeah. So you were saying, um, learning, learning different genres and different styles and stuff to try and broaden your horizons. That's exactly what I did when, I was in fifth and sixth year at school with drums. Yeah. Uh, I was introduced to, I've mentioned this a thousand times, but I'm going to mention it again. So yeah, tough. Um, <laughs> I was introduced <laughs> to um, progressive metal drumming and was totally blown away mm. by it. And it was bands like Dream Theater. Um, so I had to learn so many different techniques to try and play this music because it was so complex. It was like really, really, really fast, um, like weird beats and uh, polyrhythms and all this stuff going on. It taught me so much to the point where even just, just playing your standard old rock tunes and beats and stuff becomes much more stable because if your level of ability is here and you're asked to play music here, it's going to be so solid. Um, That's it. It's like Julian, you said in a couple of episodes ago, um, it's uh, pl playing playing something simple well is yeah. the best, it's yeah. the best thing. Actually, like you say, country music has done that for you. Yeah, yeah. Me learning, uh -huh. so like, um, yeah, learning how to play like prop, like country, like, country bass lines and yeah. actually just like sticking to just like the one thing just and keeping it consistent or like the one shape or the one kind of like riff kind of thing you just move about on the on the bass it just yeah it really forces you to like i don't know yeah it was just it was probably the best best thing that i i ever did i used to at, at, at first i was just like oh this is like really really boring you know i was just like oh yeah it's just like one you know root fifth root fifth all over and over and over again yeah. kind of a thing and i was like no no it's way it's 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 way more than that you know yeah. it's yeah no it's really really good um learned more from playing country ba like country bass lines that i did from like playing anything super hard that so like yeah so it yeah that and also like like bebop like walking bass lines as well because it's very much the same kind of thing you know in that the rhythmically it's it's just you know quarter notes um with maybe like the occasional like triplet thing happening but like it's it's all quarter notes but the notes are constantly having like changing all the time and it's you need to be really really fluid so yeah bebop bass lines and country music highly recommend 
it's a uh, good tra- <laughs> it's good it's a good shed yeah it's funny too when you it kind of ties into the whole portfolio career idea because i've found a lot of the time mm. if you're working particularly with singers say it's a singer that's gone i want this band put together um i've got a lot mm. of songs i'm wanting to record them they're not looking for people to come in that maybe take five takes to do it but can do this out of this world solo they're looking for folk that their main skills are locking in with a group of musicians that they've never dealt with before that can yeah. be solid mm-hmm. and get it done quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Usually, like if if you can just be super tight, but have the capacity to add in the odd thing. Yeah. But if yeah. if your focus has been on consistency, tightness, tuning, and mm-hmm. not on kind of the most outrageous solo you can find, mm-hmm. yeah, you'll get uh-huh. the gigs. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's exactly. kind of soul it's destroying like... when you think about it too much. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, it's it, yeah. Actually, reminded me that jazz bass player Ray Brown basically said the exact same thing. Like when you're learning how to play upright bass, the first thing you want to learn how to do is just get a good sound. That's like, it. don't learn how to play fast solos. Like none of that nonsense. Just get a really good in tune sound, and you'll be you'll you'll be living for like on it on for the rest of your life you know yeah. no problem. um it's ex- exactly the same yeah i've got it's, a friend of mine it applies to everything who, it's a friend of mine who's a session drummer this was back in like maybe the late 90s early noughties and he would get called up for a session and uh, it was like his first proper professional session he was just out of uni and you know he's trying to get in there and he got the call and he brought his kit and he brought his biggest kit um, we're talking six toms, double kick <laughs> pedal. He had his main snare. He had a piccolo snare. He had tambourines and shakers and maybe about seven or eight cymbals, two ride cymbals, like just brought the whole kit. And he set all this up and they all set up to record. And then the, the, the singer, the sort of, the artist that he was working with, he's like, can you just give us a, just just a, a bass drum, kind of hi-hat, you know, boom, t- boom, t- boom. And basically most of the song was just like, boom, t- boom. T- and maybe in the chorus it was like, boom, t- get, boom, t- get. He didn't touch a cymbal or a tom, the whole session had it all set up. And then <laughs> he was like, oh, okay, right. I don't necessarily have to bring the kitchen sink to every performance. And, and that goes for equipment and it also goes for actual what you're playing. Sometimes the simplest... The simplest, simple is most, more often than not, is probably the right course of action. Just keep it simple, mm. stupid. It's the KISS principle. It. Keeps coming up in this podcast, doesn't it, Julie? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. We should just call the podcast the KISS principle. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Uh, that's right. So, I um, want to move on to uh, another uh, thing I saw you doing with NOS and something you did really well actually and I wanted to pick your brain on it so we talk about we've talked about this a couple of times on the podcast and that's the crowd crowd funding thing the uh, taking um, funds from your fans or whatever to try and fund an album or whatever and you guys have done that is it twice you've done this now or is it yeah twice just finished the second yeah one, yeah. yeah I saw um, that's that's something that I've we've never ever tried. We've never really given it a good run, um, just because we've never. I don't know. We've just never. We've never managed to just um, commit to it. Um, and I wanted yeah. to pick your brain and like, because you were un- unbelievably successful. Especially the first time you told me um, it was a couple of years ago. You, t- I think you did that one. You told me you That's you managed right. to save up for that album. So how how do you go about? Um, even starting a thing like that? Yeah, so it's funny. It's a question that a few folk have come with recently, just kind of on the back of it. Mm. Um, it's it, it's a it's a big project to undertake. I, yeah. I went and did a... There's a, a kind of... I don't know if you call them a company, a kind of organisation, the Scottish Music Industry Association. Yeah. And they did a talk on crowdfunders. So it was quite general, kind of across the board. Mm-hmm. But there was loads of little things I picked up on in that. And one, it's funny. Again, it's one of those things that you go, 
oh, I wish I didn't actually think, or I wish I didn't know that. But it's almost considering, in terms of audience fan base, mm-hmm. a Facebook like is worth about 5% of what an email sign up is. Yeah. And it's thinking about yeah. stages of engagement that's been the main thing that we've gone, okay, where are we where are we going to find the people that are actually willing to put money into it? Mm-hmm. Um so you you can ask and it's a bit like media questions. You're asking who, what, why and when is your kind of yeah. main thing. So you need to figure out who are the people so chances are people at university that don't have an awful lot of disposable income aren't going to order a £100 tune composition. Um, but they might order an £8 digital download. Yeah. Um, so as you kind of find your tiers of people, I think folk music, again, it's slightly different in that there's quite a lot of the fan base are quite willing to still buy physical albums. Um, so we have a lot of those that we've built up over the years on a mailing list. So at any live show, we put a sheet out and say, chuck your email down and we'll give you the updates. Yeah. And by that, you're getting much closer to the person than a hopeful scroll yep. on Facebook. Um, and those are the type of people that are going to go, oh, well, I might get a tune written for my daughter's birthday or I would quite like them to have an instrument lesson. Mm-hmm. Um, any of those kind of things yeah mm. kind of consider as a kind of long way of saying consider who it is that would support you and what would they like it's your mm. customer avatar um, basically yeah for sure and you can kind of see by scene specific like we look around other folk bands and see what they're offering mm-hmm. and add that to the ideas we've had ourselves mm-hmm. um, yeah they say then, they say like an email an emailing list is like second only to word of mouth for for um, yeah. getting uh, stuff out there. Like social media is not all it seems. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. yeah, I think if you can get as close as possible, like you say, that isn't word of mouth. Um, certainly emails and even just having a sign up on your website or putting that sign up form on your. Uh, on your Facebook pages, I've seen a few folk doing that. They've got oh, I'll you can get a digital download of this track mm-hmm. if you sign up to your mailing list. <clears throat> Again, it's not genre specific, no. but people could go. Okay, I would quite like to listen to that track. I'll chuck my email down. Oh, what's the difference anyway? Yeah. But then you're checking through your emails and go, oh, I quite enjoyed that track, mm-hmm. and mm. they've emailed straight to my inbox. I'll maybe go and check out their crowdfunder too. Yeah. Um, and I think about 50% of the eventual backers came from our email list um, and the rest came from other bits and pieces. But yeah. Yeah, it's a huge chunk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if anybody was looking to do a crowdfunder, I'd say get your mailing list yeah, rolling yeah, yeah. in mm. advance. It's a, it's a tough job because you've got so much work over and above. You've got to keep the keep the ball rolling and keep your keep yourself top of mind that's the most difficult part that's of running fair. a band i'd say is keeping top of mind so the f- folk don't forget you um that's whether fair. it's whether it's social media posts or updates in the email and i think that the trickiest part i find with with all that stuff is actually finding things to post um that's it oh just yeah. drudgery trying to figure out like what can we what can we put <laughs> put up and and sometimes something is better than nothing, you know. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, um, that drives me crazy. That stuff. Um, I'm I'm I know. Oh, it's totally not in my wheelhouse. Um, yeah, social media has never been a a thing. I I, I kind of know roughly how to structure a post if I need to do it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it's certainly not something that comes naturally. Yeah, but it, like you say, it's such a huge part of yeah working as a musician now. Mm. Um, even more so nowadays. Yeah, it has to be. Because um, it's quite important. Well, that's that's funny. You're 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 doing you're doing the job that a record label would have done for thirty years yeah. ago. Um, you know, you're doing the sourcing the the studio. You're um, 
you're sorting out the the fees for recording and mixing and mastering. You're talking like distribution, uh, production of CDs and vinyl, depending on what era or whatever. Your merch, your tour guide, your tour planning, and your just, just endless and yeah. all of that. All of that used to be handled by you know your big record labels, and all That's the artists right. did was turn up. But now, all of that stuff. Because of the the internet, the invention of the internet, all of this stuff has become much easier to do by yourself. But it's still a load of work, and that's it. If you're not yeah. willing to do it, it's not going to happen for you. And if people keep chasing this old dream of, you know, we need to get signed, we need to get signed, and it's really it's not the case anymore. It really, it really isn't. Um, yeah, I think hmm. it was a big thing for us. So, so labels aren't as big a thing but we were looking it's more booking agents yes yeah, on yeah. the trad scene um, but it, it kind of it fills a similar kind of gap so mm-hmm. um we were we were always thinking oh down the line it would be magic to have someone fight in our corner yeah. in terms of the festival circuit yeah um but i think the important thing that we did was we didn't wait about for them to come to us and go, oh, what's we'd we'd like to sign you or something, and you couldn't really approach them to just ask because they would go, well, you're not a big enough name to make money for us yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think again, it's one of those age-old pieces of advice, like the Kiss principle, of just if you're putting your head down and getting on it and working hard. Mm. doing all those things turning up and your band being a pleasure to be around yeah yeah it's like it's amazing how quick someone decides oh their music was really good but oh, they left a mess of the accommodation and <laughs> they were a bit kind of they weren't particularly great to speak to mm-hmm. oh, if we've got the option of two bands to have back next time yeah. we'll maybe go that far one yeah yeah every every little yeah. move that you make down the line is heading towards getting signed, being liked, a mailing list mm. member thinking, oh, they were a really friendly bunch. I'll chuck some money in for a CD. Aye. Um, you're, mm. you're constantly on show. And I think if you're generally conducting yourself in a way that's quite positive, mm-hmm. it'll stand you in good stead Yeah, Definitely. for all those projects yeah. down the line. Long gone are the days of trashing hotel rooms like the Who. <laughs> That's it. Can he do that anymore? No. You no. can try it, but I don't know. If it uh, would yeah, go you could try it. Yeah, I'm sure you'd end up on the news somehow. But local you news, maybe you didn't have yeah. uh, five star ratings in TripAdvisor back in the 1970s. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. <laughs> um, do not recommend this band. No. no, they trash toilets every time they they turn up. That's it. Uh, it's yeah, it's. There was something funny. Uh, I think it was Liam Shortle when he was on. He said something funny, uh, or was it Graham? I can't remember. I think maybe both of them said said it. But if you want to be, uh, if you want to keep top of mind, you want to be, a, you know, a successful band. You've got to be willing to spend absolutely huge amounts of time behind a laptop doing all the all, all yeah. the stuff. You know, because yeah. um, they. But I think what, what I can't remember who said it. But, they said they couldn't believe how much time they spend doing all the emails and all the social media and all that stuff behind the laptop. Cause it. It's like, oh, spend more time doing that than actually playing the instrument. Uh, yeah, it <clears> genuinely is. It was funny, the start of lockdown, a few folk were going, oh, so, so what are you going to do for April? I was like, I'm going to tackle the backlog of yeah, emails yeah. and <laughs> funding applications and nonsense that all need sorted. So the first month was just taken up catching my tail on yeah. admin jobs. Yep. That is all over now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just wait and do. But um yeah, it's a huge part of it. Um and I think it's good if you can distribute that amongst band members and things. I often feel for solo artists that are taking all of that yeah. on themselves, it'll be quite a tough ask. Mm-hmm. Aye, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, we always talk yeah. about delegation, you know, manage your stuff. Giving people yep. jobs to do, uh, it really, it really mm. does help. Especially when they're they're all in the loop. It's when they fall that's out of the it. loop. That's when it all goes, goes to the, yeah. yeah. So, 
we're, we've come to that point in the in the interview where we ask uh, <laughs> your best and worst gigs. So we'll start with the best. Oof. What's your most favourite best gig gigging moment? <sighs> There's a few. Um, I wonder. There's a couple of ones. There's been there's been a couple of European festivals for the Nos Boys that have been mm-hmm. pretty special nights. They've kind of the stars have just kind of aligned, and there's yeah. been a good mm. group of folk about, and it's just been pretty excellent. But I think the main highlight would be so the Orkney Folk Festival run a thing called the Gathering mm-hmm. Series, and essentially what they do is Arcadian musicians are brought together, usually during the folk festival, and they have a theme each year. So they might have, we did a transatlantic one, so there was a group of Arcadians, and then any of the uh, US or Canadian artists that were over, they came across and we kind of collaborated for a one-off night. Um, And there was an Orkney Shetland one. Um, There's just been a few different combinations, but myself and Aidan were asked to front the Generations um, gathering so it ranged from we had a 50 strong fiddle group from the secondary school all the way up to a man that's been singing songs and playing harmonica in his 80s <laughs> um, and wow. we did we did the original show at the folk festival and then we were asked to do it at the fruit market in Glasgow at Celtic Connections mm-hmm. so it was a full 245s of Orkney goodness <laughs> um, as a headline nice. at the fruit market for Celtic and uh, it's kind of like you were saying the months before it were spent, there was 52 people on the stage at its most <sighs> and the admin and the organising of rehearsals and sheet music and card <laughs> charts and oh, no. even transporting everybody from Orkney making sure they could all sound check building tech specs mm-hmm. the whole lot it was a mammoth undertaking, but the gig itself was... The whole thing, start to finish, just worked perfectly. Mm. Um, and, yeah, along with the fact that it was an amazing group of musicians and your pals, and then being asked to kind of look after something that's got that bit of reputation, I think. Mm. That's, especially, that's a long-winded one. Especially yeah. when it pays off. It's, and That's it. Yeah, yeah and it, it's really, really good. It's when it doesn't go well. Is it's um, it's very sore, especially when it's, it's all down to you. Uh, yeah, and things start yeah, to go wrong. No, it, the the pressure's on, but yeah, I think that has to be a gig highlight mm-hmm. for me. Yeah, it's pretty excellent. Nice. So we'll go on to the 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 worst <laughs> the worst the gig worst you've ever played. Oof, there's quite a lot of them too. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I could lie to you and say that they've all gone swimmingly and there's not been any issues at all. It's funny, there's never been one that's taken all of... Like, there's never been one that every single part of it has been negative, thankfully. Yeah. Um, mm. There's been a few horrendous drives. Mm-hmm. Um, our last North show was up in Russia and we landed. We left Glasgow at three in the morning landed in Moscow at six in the evening and then drove for eight hours in the snow um, up to this small town in the north of Russia. And then we did another gig the next night and came home the next day. Oh, no. And the gigs themselves were nice, but the travel was... We were all (laughs) raging for both days. We were just livid because (laughs) you were just in the back of this tiny little car being driven around... Not really sure where you were going. Oh, no. um, but it lines up oh, that the boy. gigs themselves were quite nice. Um, there was another one that the travel was all fine. Um, it was last November that we did. It was a, I think it was a 16 day UK tour taken in Scotland and England. And most of them had gone really, really well. And we arrived in Leeds, walked in for that one. Travel, perfect. No bother at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we walked in and we'd sent them uh, I think it was either 50 or 70 posters that they'd requested and we're like that's quite a lot but okay you mm. you can have that 
Um, so it, it cost a fair bit to put the gig on and we're making sure, oh yeah, any word on ticket sales from your end? And they were like, oh, they're slow, but um, we'll keep it going. Mm-hmm. And uh, we arrived and not a single poster was up in the venue. Oh. Um, so that oh. that set me off to start with. I was <laughs> up barking at the bar, wondering <laughs> why on earth we'd sent, oh, we had a tidy up of posters and they must have thought your gig was done. Um, what? So that was a shambles. And then we went round the corner into the venue and the engineer, I think he was about 40 minutes late. Um, oh my God. No tables or chairs set up, so that was our job. And then when we got the sheet down for the door, there was only seven tickets sold. Oh, my God. So you're sitting there going, how many seats do you actually put out? Luckily, it wasn't a big room. Mm -hmm. And again, I think if anybody tells you they've not had that situation, they're bending the truth ever so slightly. It, mm. it does happen. It's just not the gig that you put oh. on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, we, we've definitely had that. Exact that same story. Happened to us. Pretty yeah. much yeah. verbatim. Like, even uh, yeah. Yeah. advertising a gig that's happening in two days, but not the gig that's happening tonight. You know, that's it. some com- comedians we, coming on on Sunday and we're playing on the Friday, yeah. but nothing. Yeah. There's oh. an ABBA cover band at the weekend, but you're <laughs> yeah. on on the Thursday. And there's <laughs> Uh, and Mad. like you turn up and I think we eventually ended up with nine people in and you still have to do the same show of these course, people yeah. have spent what they would on a ticket so you have to give them mm-hmm. the gig and we turned it into a bit of fun yeah. like yeah. you're kind of asking them to sing along one at a time mm. <laughs> it's that kind of awkward <laughs> situation but oh, no. um, so yeah actually playing the music a few pints in felt grand yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it's one of those moments that you fully question, especially if a couple have gone really well, but you've still got a bit of the tour to go. You go, was was this a wise move? Yeah, to do mm. a week night in Leeds where we've never been. But it's the kind of thing. Again, those people have paid the tickets. A few of them signed up to the mailing list and went. Oh, if if we'd known that you hadn't sold many tickets, there's a there's a folk night on mm. the night before that. And you just learn from these things. And yeah. once you've done the first gig, it's an awful lot easier to go back. Because mm-hmm. mm, um, you know what's If expect. people have had a good night. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's none that have gone completely as a nightmare, but there's, <laughs> there's been a few that have been less than ideal for sure. Yeah. It's, it's funny, like, when you when you've done maybe three or four gigs in your tour or whatever and they've all been great, you sort of assume that the, the fifth and sixth ones are going to be just fine and then Amazing, you just get, yeah. it's just, just, just the complete opposite can happen just like that. And you think sometimes yeah. you go to a big place, especially like Leeds, you think, oh, it's quite quite a large population. We should get yeah. some folk in the door. No, nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> you can That's go to it. some remote, I think remote villages in the north of Scotland and get the place packed and yeah. there's like no one lives there. So bizarre. Yeah, it is. It's crazy. And I think it's the kind of thing that could really quickly become disheartening. But I think if you're quite open about it and just go, well, that's that's the way it is. Absolutely. Those, those mm-hmm. nights happen. Yeah. Um, but you kind of have them to fully appreciate when you've got an absolutely rocking gig. That restores your faith and you start. Yeah. You start doing it yeah. again. But Cool. Um, yeah. So... Coming up on the, on the end of the interview, um, what have you got uh, coming up? Have you got any new things in the pipeline yeah, that you want to so talk about? I've been working, so just Celtic Connections passed in January. I did a commission to do with Arcadians that travelled across to Canada. Yep. Um, so essentially cool. there was kind of early 1600s to the 1900s. There was people from Orkney that were offered the chance. The ships came from London and stopped off in Orkney for some supplies before they went to the north of Canada. Um, And eventually they realised that Arcadians were quite up for escaping poverty and (laughs) going across and working in the fur trade. And I think by the mid-1700s, 80% of the company's workforce, so 400 and something of the 500 staff were from Orkney in um, the north of Canada, wow. kind of, um, wow, yeah, the northeast 
kind of side. So um, that had been inspiring music for a wee while, and I got my finger out and uh, wrote an evening of music for that, mm-hmm. um, and mm. had a, a band from Quebec, Levant du Nord, came and played some of it with us, and just a kind of a group of musicians that I pulled together mm-hmm. and from that I thought I'd use lockdown to record the album yep. of that music so got some creative Scotland funding um off the back of the theme and that album I've just um been reviewing the master this morning so hey. I'm gonna wait and take it out in early 2021 mm-hmm. um so I've got a bit of work to do on the artwork and bits of licensing and things and mm-hmm. PR. So that's that's the next thing. And we're also writing a new NOS record just now that'll hopefully come out all being well with restrictions and lockdowns and mm. studio closures. Hopefully that'll come out in the springtime next year too. So it's kind of using this time to be proactive. Yeah. So again, like the ball's rolling when we come out. Fantastic. So if anyone wants cool. to follow your stuff or reach you, where where's the best place? Spotify yeah, or Instagram so, or um yeah, usual socials. It's all under Graham Rory. Graham with an H and Rory R O R I E. Um or Graham Rory dot com is where oh. you can kind of get a link to everything off of that. Right. Um if they fancy looking nice. it up. Yeah. So thanks very much for, for doing this. This was great. Not at all. Um, yeah, and it's thank nice you. Catching up with you. Super interesting. Yeah, you too. Nice to see you. Um, and yeah, all the best. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we'll wrap that up. Um, I'm not sure what, we're, what we've got on the pipeline for next week, as usual. Um, we, we never do, but we always come up with something. 30, it's amazing. 37 interviews in, it. or 37 podcasts in, we still don't know what we're doing. That's just, that's life, <laughs> isn't it? Anyway, yeah. um, if you if you enjoy these interviews, please let us know, and we'll get some more guests on. Um, and if you don't like it, well, tough. We're still going to do it anyway. Um, <laughs> so um, we'll try and think of something to come up with next week. I don't know. Julian will have a great idea. Julian's always got some uh, well, uh, well card I- ideas. So I'm I'm sure. Yeah, we'll but see. Hope you all have a good week, and hope you enjoy the episode. And we'll see you all next time. Okay, bye. Right. Bye.